Greetings and salutations. Welcome to this episode of Playwright Spotlight. Before we begin, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below, and share the show with your friends. If you're listening to us on your favorite pod podcast platform, be sure to leave a five-star review and subscribe to the channel. My guest today is a graduating senior at the prestigious, prestigious Harvard Westlake in North Hollywood, California. His musicals Unauthorized Aid and Bakery of Love were both selected for the school's annual Playwrights Festival. He begins attending Harvard next year as an undecided freshman. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ian Kim. Hey. Thanks for doing this, yeah, man. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So, I, the reason why I, I, I mean, I could have brought anybody in, uh, in this festival. Everybody was so talented. But you did two musicals, and not to say that there weren't a couple of other ones, but you made it seem so simple. And I just want to unpack your process and find out all the details that you had to go through. Because, um, yeah, so, I mean... Let's start with unauthorized aid, and and the the premise behind that. What? How would you come up with it? And then, how do you proceed to develop that that musical? Uh, yeah. So um, unauthorized aid, um, which I wrote last year, um, was um, I worked on it through the Playwrights Festival. So they had like this sort of timeline of like dates that you're supposed to like have a script down um, and like have. Um, like start like workshopping it and having a table read um, and it was designed for plays so they didn't really have um, the musical infrastructure and um, stuff built into it um, since it was a musical um, and it was my first time I really didn't know how much time it would take so I completely like missed all the deadlines and stuff which came back to bite me later but it did give me more time to um, sort of adjust to the process it was the first time I had written like a musical like with story um, I had written like a few songs um, earlier um, in, in seventh grade, I wrote my first um, song. It was actually like a, a rap, um, and it was a diss track of um, my a school bus driver because he was late several times in a row. And for some reason, I was really annoyed. I mean, I don't think I'd be that annoyed now. Um, sure. But I had too much time, um, and I wrote it on the bus. And my parent, I showed it to my parents, and they're like, hey, this is like not that bad. Maybe you should like write songs. And I was like, okay. And then I didn't do it again for like four years. But then I came back um, last year, and um, so Unauthorized Aid is a 40-minute musical um, that is based on the Scarlet Letter, um, but set in a high school, um, but not like Easy A. Um, it is different. It, um, okay. it centers around an academic cheating scandal, um, and an important like, plot point is that um, the person who's accused of cheating um, on this test and who's being prosecuted by the honor board, um, which is a parody of Harvard Westlake's honor board, um, actually was aided by a member of said honor board, and it becomes this huge scandal. And it's this like satire, really like largely based on um, Harvard Westlake as an institution. There are, like lots of puns and jokes about that. Right. I know that you had a disclaimer at the beginning. Yes, that um, <laughs> yes, it that um. Let's see, can I remember? Um, that it's it's not a reflection of Harvard Westlake or yeah that is not a, <laughs> what is it? That, um, all characters and events are fictional um, and any um, resemblances are uh, coincidental and should not be taken personally uh, yes that is the first line <laughs> fair fair enough so okay so go back you said something that that kind of uh, stood out to me and that was that the missing the deadlines came back to bite you. What? How so? Ooh, and I just moved your camera. <laughs> Let me fix that. <laughs> right. Hello. You're back. There we go. Um, yeah. Um, so um, as probably anyone who's worked on a musical knows, um, it's always like crammed in the last week, no matter like how well prepared you think you are. It's always like down to the minute. So like it's pretty much a given that like by, you know, just do the process, especially like in a, in a student musical, mm -hmm. like it will be rushed. Um, we had the additional problem that um, while well, I was working with a, um, a co-composer slash arranger at the time. And you um, wrote Bakery of Love by yourself, yes? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. sorry to interrupt, but keep going. Yeah, so um, so in Authorized Aid, um, there were more songs than in Bakery of Love. It was more complicated. Um, and so I was working with an arranger who had some more knowledge of like music theory, chords, and stuff, because I'm used to like writing melodies. Um, I play an instrument, I sing, um, and I know how like to do like musical lines and some harmonies. Mm -hmm. But um, I wanted to use the expertise of like a pianist who actually you know had the chords in her fingers um to sort of um 
make the songs just sound better sure. and have more natural like chord progressions and that sort of thing. Um, but that added a lot of time to the process and, you know, um, a lot of back and forth. And the collaboration process was great. That's um, what I was just going to ask. How, how was that? Cl- to cl- yeah, it, it was amazing. Um, it was um, I was a junior at the time and I was collaborating with a senior, um, Yoshimi Kumura. Right now she's at Yale. She's doing um, acapella stuff. I think she's doing some theater stuff, too. Okay. Um, and yeah, so that was like really, really great. Like we had so much fun and like the, the connection was, was really awesome. Um, but it did take a lot of time and we were both busy and, um, you know, with school stuff comes up and, um, you know, you never know how long things are going to take. Right, right. And then, you know, your the software gets buggy and, you know, like files are lost and Ugh. all sorts of things. Um, I was working with like MuseScore and Premiere. I'm pretty used to Premiere. So that didn't cause a lot of problems. The MuseScore had some autosave issues. So that caused some problems. And so we ended up, I think the script was done by, um, I think, let's see, I'll try to remember. Around, I think, l- late November, early December. Okay. Um, and then I started writing the music um, mostly over winter break. Um, and that took, let's see, about until hmm, like the middle of spring break. And rehearsals had started actually a couple weeks before that. So mm-hmm. we had, I'd say, about 70% of the music done by the time rehearsals wow. started. Um, so okay. we had stuff to work with, but it was definitely sort of jammed in there. Um, and we, thankfully, I mean, we rushed and we got all the music done um, and we were teaching it to the to the singers. Um, but it definitely took a lot of like um, extra work on our part to get the music together, schedule like additional rehearsals with musicians. Mm-hmm. The Playwrights Festival is great. They handle like the actors and like pretty much like for a normal play, like everything works like great. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah. But we had to um, get an extra rehearsal for the pit. Um, we had friends in orchestra and we we're like, hey, you know, we have this thing. Can you make these dates? Can, can you learn this music? The music wasn't that hard, um, but it was a, a big job just to like organize that and get it together. Um, our first sits probe, um, which was the first time we had the orchestra with the um, singers, um, was really fun, but also like extremely chaotic as you have people with new music um, and people who had you know just learned their songs and trying to get it all together. Um, so luckily, we were very organized, um, and so we had as few hiccups as possible. But we did have um, a lot of like time spent during rehearsals trying to get the music together, and then we had less time for like staging and tech and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, which is, you know, always rushed anyways. Um, you, you mentioned Premiere and one other, one other. Uh, music score. Okay. So, but you still played live. So where do those programs come into play? Or, or is that kind of like, this is, you, you play, okay, we're going to make this notation. This is, and that, is that how, how you're doing this? Um, yeah. So, and then how, and real quick, just because I want, I want to make this part of the question as well. What, what advice do you have on, or what did you learn how to, let's make sure we do this so we don't lose a file or something doesn't crash or what, or just in case somebody else is using these exact same things, they, they, maybe you've figured something out that like, hey, by the way, if you are, if this ever happens, this is how to prevent it. Um, yeah, so um, I'm a classically um, trained musician. I've been studying viola at the Coburn School since seventh grade. Um, I do sing in choir, and I'm used to reading off sheet music. There are a lot of people who compose who, um, like, for example, are in more of the jazz world or the pop world, mm-hmm. and, like, they can name a chord and write the chord down, and it all makes sense, and they can sort of, like, improvise. Um, I don't really work that way, so how I how I compose music is I, um, I think of, like, the, the line in my head, and then I write it down. Um, and then maybe I get a couple harmony lines I can sort of figure out if it's on like a third or a fifth or something kind of simple like that. Um, and I write it all down in MuseScore. That's the, um, notating software. Okay. Um, and so that creates the sheet music. Um, I sent it to, um, on, 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 on unauthorized aid, um, I sent it to Yoshi who, um, sort of cleaned it up and, you know, added some more formal like chord progressions, um, just to make it, you know, make more sense, um, formally. Um, and then, um, often we recorded tracks um, with piano, um, with her playing the piano, so it wasn't um, the Muse score, sort of like computer-generated sound, right. which you can get, and I, I have used, um, but it's just, you know, it doesn't sound as good. Right, uh, yeah, because obviously you're not playing, you're, you're using an orchestra, or, or at least a number of band members, and then, of course, um, you're, not, you're not playing with it, you're not playing, they're not singing to a track, is what I mean, you're not recording something that they're gonna sing along to, which is great. Um, Okay, so and so the collaboration was great. You guys never never butted heads or anything like that. Never had any issues. 
Um, yeah, I'd say for the most part, it was like super smooth. Um, you know, we're both really into like the sort of the tone of the piece and like the rhythm. Um, there were a couple times where um, I like had this vision um, for um, the, the third song, this duet, and I want it to be this sort of like slow emotional thing. Um, but then you know, she was telling me like that, like, you know, it dragged. Um, and mm. I was like, no, you know, it's insane. That sounds good. Um, and you know, I, I had a, you know, I had a, well, I guess whatever the equivalent for vision is for hearing, um, in my head. Um, and it took me a while to be like, okay, like, yes, that actually does drag. And you know, she was right. And it sounded better. We added some more of like, um, uh, sort of lilting rhythm to it, which um, added some variety. Um, and so a lot of times like she sort of like added like really like, like different ideas that I didn't have before. Um, sometimes like it was a new like direction that the melody went, a different chord progression that had a little bit more like tension um, that like really made like sort of the, like the music pop, I'd say. Um, Cause as far as the melody is like, you know, it has to be catchy and it has to you know, line up with the stress of the syllables. And then after that, it's sort of a process of like looking at the chords and like giving it more punch. And that was where um, Yoshi like really came in. Um, because the music just sounded way better after she looked yeah. at it. Um, and yeah, as for like the instrumentation, um, it was all, it was all, um, composed and um, arranged for piano because okay. that's just what we had. And we didn't know what kind of instruments we would have. Um, we ended up having, um, a piano, a keyboard, a violin, viola, um, guitar and bass. Um, which was, I mean, it was way more than, you know, I, you know, had initially hoped. Um, I mean, it was great. Um, but I, um, it's and it sounded really really good um but it was a lot to manage um, sure yeah yeah i can imagine so so in the, okay so you want to put all that just so i'm imagining that you were you're comp composing for every single instrument um hmm. let's see I, i'm I'll, I'll try to remember um i mean because they're not all playing the same thing right i mean right. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so yeah. Um, so actually, it was interesting. We sort of had like a, a dual um, orchestration process after we had all the um, all the arranging and all the chords down. Um, conspicu um, conspicuously absent of, from what you usually have, and we didn't have a drum set. Um, so rhythm was um, mm. something we were working on. Um, luckily enough, we had a bass who was a bassist who was really great. Um, and stand up or electric. Electric. Yeah. Um, and um, so. Basically, what we had is um, a few classically trained musicians. We had um, a keyboard, a, who was a classical pianist, and our violin, viola, um, who read sheet music. And um, I wrote the sheet music for um, the harmonies for that. And then um, for our bassist, um, our other keyboard, and our guitarist, they were sort of more in the jazz rock world. Right. So um, Yoshi, who had, was familiar with chords, could write chord sheets, and they could sort of improvise off of that. Um, and that gave us sort of more flexibility when we were having like transitions, when we were having like um, instruments come in one at a time. Um, and that was like super helpful that we had that sort of flexibility. Right. Cause maybe, because they're not, I'm, I'm oh, hit the wrong button. I, I'm, I'm, cause again, this is so outside of my wheelhouse. So I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to imagine like, okay, we've got the chords, we've got this out, we know, we know this, the song, we know how it sounds. Now we've got, we wrote it for piano, but now we've got four other instruments that we've just added. So now how does that work? I don't, I'm not quite sure I grasp exactly how, what that next step is, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, cause you've got the piano chords, but that's not what it's going to be on a, on a violin. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you discern how, where, where does that, how do you delegate where that, how that goes now? Yeah, I think for me, because I was a string musician, um, I sort of, like, had a feel for, like, the direction that, like, harmony lines should go. And there are no, like, real strict rules. Like, it just should follow this these, like, specific notes. Mm -hmm. And, like, generally, the, the, the note closest to the note before it and the note after it is the note you use. But there are, like, these sort of, like, informal, like, patterns in music. I mean, they're probably okay. formal, but I don't know a ton of music sure. theory. Um, so I was just sort of going with the flow. And I play viola, which is a harmony instrument, and I sing bass, which is a harmony part. So um, the the sort of flow of the cadences um, worked more naturally for me. I could just sort of um, like write it out, um, and it's. I think it's honestly sort of hard to go wrong with with strings. Mm -hmm. um, it's more about knowing like sort of when to use them than really like the notes that they'd play, um, and that was a lot of trial and error. Um, I think for for our bassist, um, it was really about like laying down the rhythms and like knowing when to add more energy, maybe um, do two instead of one. Um, and really just like adapt to the sort of flow. Um, and cause like the, like bass players, um, 
I think are just really good at what they do and they see mm-hmm. the music and, you know, they know what kind of rhythmic patterns would make it, you know, groovy. Um, and the guitarist was uh, strumming out chords and that just added um, nice atmosphere. So th- so on that note, let's talk about that collaboration process. How did that go? Were the musicians all coming in? I'm like, oh, I got this idea. Let me, let me throw this at you. Or, or is it just like, I already know what to do and, the, and they just, they just riffed. Yeah, um, our musicians were super professional, and I think like usually the 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 case for like musical pits and like for like film music is like generally they train on music that's much harder than the music you're giving them. So you know the one of the um, one of the violinists I had, Ryan Chang, in my class, um, he has played um, you know some really difficult like um, you know Bach, um, Paganini, mm. that kind of thing. And so when I'm like, okay, you know, play this like little like uh, melody <laughs> line in the top mirroring, he's like, okay, fine, you know, it's basically sight readable, um, you know, for our. I guess. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> music is like is like a pretty insane art. People just like go at it for for years and years. Sure. And years. Yeah. And so once once they get in the pit, um, that was one of the one of the easier things to do, definitely. Um, I'd say coordinating with the singers was um, a little bit more difficult because you had different entrances and then you had also lines and you didn't know how long those would take. So you have safeties, um, but also like what a is lot it, of uh, safety. What is that? Yeah. So a safety is basically um, like you have an instrumental part that plays under the uh, dialogue when it switches uh, from sing to dialogue. Yeah. And like sometimes the dialogue takes longer or shorter. So sure. it's usually a couple measures that are repeated and then um, the conductor cues them in when the dialogue is about to end. Got it. Okay. Um, which is a lot of where a lot of um, rehearsals get bogged down. So when you're writing these these um, these roles and these songs, in, in when you, when you're starting that, do you know that hey, okay, this this uh, role is going to be for a tenor, this is going to be for a soprano, this is going to be for a bass, or is it just like very just general? And then whoever we cast, whatever they are, are you how are you writing that, or are you writing that? Um, yeah, so I was super flexible with um, like voice type and stuff like that. Like we don't have a ton of singers, right. so okay. you can it's it's sort of um, especially male singers. So you can sort of tell what ranges you you have as options. Um, but like I don't have perfect pitch. Like I can't really tell the difference between something sure. and something transposed up like a whole step or a half step or something. So um, oftentimes I, I wrote it, and you know as long as it's reasonable, um, you know I could you know change it up and down, and, sure, okay. and that wasn't really a problem for the female singers. Um, at least for the male singers, I can sort of test if it's like you know really high. You know, my my range is not super high, um, but I can just sort of test it out. Um, for for the the female parts that I, or for the the soprano alto parts that I've written, um, both in Unauthorized Aid and Bakery of Love, um, some of the really high parts go really really high. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I noticed. And my, and my <laughs> actors have been like, yeah, this is not possible. I have to like transpose. Well, not trans either transpose it down or just like move the whole part down like a fifth. You know when it gets up there. Um, and uh, Weston seemed to do have no problem. So. <laughs> no, no, Weston Weston's range is amazing, and, and I honestly don't really know how he does it. Um, <laughs> but for for Anusha's part, and then um, for for last year for the parts of um, Anna Dimsworth. Um, she had this like part where she was like, it's already really high. And then she has an octave jump above that and, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, and they're like, yeah, like we can't uh, physically. <laughs> <laughs> and we went back and changed Fair stuff. Enough. But right. that was sort of by a case by case basis. Where they're like, yeah, you can't do this. So did you participate? How many years uh, uh, of the festival did you do as far as the Playwrights Festival, as far as writing? Um, yeah, I've written um, all three years. So 10th grade, I did a regular play um, and then unauthorized aid last year in bakery this year. Okay, great. All right, so let's um, let's talk about that play. Let's, let's talk about um, what that was, what the process of that was. Um, was first play? In, yeah, your first one. Yeah. And then what, how have you, how have you evolved as, well, I don't know if I, you can say it's a play, right? Because your other two were musicals, and we'll get into that later. But let's talk about your first one first and, and what that was and how you how you approached that. Uh, yeah, so my first play, um, it was, I think, roughly uh, 15, 20 minutes. Um, the, I think the official cap was 15, but it ended up running long. Um, it was a play called Robo Monk. Um, <laughs> so it's like, imagine Robocop, but monk. Um, and it's um, are we talking like a friar monk or like a more like a Tibetan monk? It's 
it's complicated. <laughs> um, it's set basically in the near future. It's a satire um, comedy, uh, um, sort of through line. Um, and it's set in a future where um, religion in America is dying. And, um, you know. Are you sure it's set in the future, not in the present? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just things have gotten worse and, you know, the, whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of like um, riffing on like contemporary fears and, you know, maybe manufactured fears. Sure. Okay. Fair enough. This, yeah. You yeah. Know, this like religious moral collapse in America. And out of this collapse appears this android robot machine who has all the knowledge of every religion in the world programmed in its head. And it's here on Earth to spread the religions, uh, you know, and to bring religion back to the world and save humanity from atheism. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm agnostic, so this is all like super tiny. Sure, obviously. sure. Um, but then, like later on in the story, um, yeah, we we start to inquire, and well, who created this robot, and what are their intentions? Um, and it becomes this sort of critique of like the tech industry um, and the advertising industry, and sort of how technology is meant to like capture our attention um and it it came from a lot of um sort of like random subjects that i've just been exposed to like in the past year um we were reading a lot about the catholic church and the corruption of the catholic church and how it used its religious influence for like political and economic ends um and that was something that i incorporated into the play so it turns out that the robo monk is actually sort of a machine designed to um basically um build um a loyal audience through which to market products subconsciously. Of course it, and it gets it gets wacky, um, <laughs> but that's sort of a riff off of um, like indulgences and then like how the church is allied with like different aspects of the state. Yeah, it's funny because every time I've worked in, in the festival and then the plays that present, I'm like, oh, okay, I see what I, I see what they're studying this year because sometimes there's <laughs> yeah, common yeah. themes that, that yeah, this that, year that the, the philosopher is yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so then, but so why? So what, what did you what did you have originally? And you you, you had the original concept, of the, and then you you unpacked and decided to delve into the um, the creator. Mm-hmm. And so, how I mean, did you have a complete play first, and then oh wait, we could probably play around with this a little longer. What, what was that 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 um, that brainstorming? Mm-hmm. aspect i mean what did you start with i mean did you were you writing linearly it's like oh i got the scene i'm gonna start here oh wait now i got i, I now know where i'm going and are you try, trying to kind of adding as ideas pop up and as you write or you know are you outlining what what, what do you mm-hmm. what's the process here yeah so um actually the the sort of inception of the idea was um in an early um writing workshop this is i think before the official um playwright process started but basically they they, um it was on zoom i think um because it it was still like weird coming out of covid it was at school but oh right 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 it's very strange um but basically we had this um exercise at the end of this like introductory workshop where it's like okay write a monologue that will be in your play and I was like, oh, crap, I don't have a play. Uh, I don't have characters. Oh, no. Um, and I had read this article. Actually, um, my dad sent me this article um, from NPR about um, robot monks in Japan um, that are, have been setting up residents in temples. And, you know, they're very rudimentary, you know, no AI. I think they just, like, you know, say, you know, religious texts, you know, probably kind of wrote. And right, right, right. The extent to which they talk to people. Maybe now it's changed. I don't know. Um, that could be interesting. Um, but yeah, and also this was, um, 2022. So this is before AI was cool. Right. Um, I, I will add. Um, and so, um, I was like, okay, I'm going to write a monologue from the perspective of this robot monk who has just woken up from, you know, the oblivion of, you know, tech and consciousness. And he's like, sort of like, yes, this is who I am. I have the knowledge from, you know, this text, this text, this text, you know, the, the Bible, the Quran, the, uh, the I Ching, whatever. Um, and um, it ends with this, like, really dramatic thing of, like, you know, oh, I'm here to save humanity or some, something. Um, <laughs> I don't have the text with me. <laughs> uh, Robo Monk play, as played by Keanu, Keanu Reeves. <laughs> yes. Actually, that's kind of funny um, because the, the, in the actual production, um, it, was, it was set, like, in this, like, very sort of, like, deadpan way, which I love. Um but um, yeah, so it came from that monologue, and initially that was the um, opening of the play, and then we later decided it was redundant and I cut it. Um, and so basically, I was thinking about it for a while. I was like, okay, it's this Robo Monk character. Um, 
Oh, and also I forgot to add, um, it's it's a um, as far as like the academic context of what I was working mm-hmm. at school, um, the the themes came from history from the, the Catholic Church, um, and then the story was largely inspired by Frankenstein and the idea of this like monster that wakes up with this like sort of innocence and altruism and then sort of learns about the sort of ulterior motives of people in the world and becomes corrupted and goes rogue. Um, except in this play, it's sort of switched where it turns out that um, he, he learns that he's been created for, you know, these like consumerist capitalist uses. And at the end he goes rogue and, you know, becomes basically um, a, a super powered um, robot, um, uh like environmentalist um it's it's really weird um, <laughs> but it was super fun um and at some point i think it was at some like lunch i was having i think it was at Din Tai Fung or something maybe for like a like my grandma's birthday and i was thinking about the play and, uh, and i was spitballing with my parents I, I bounce ideas a lot off of people mm-hmm. in my family um and i was like wait what if the robo monk has ads because it's digital and that would be really wacky. Um, and they're like, okay, and, you know, sure. And then I went home, and I started writing it. And it, it all came, I think, pretty linearly from that. Um, you know, the jokes sort of come up in the moment where it's like, oh, you know, I think it'd be funny if, like, the 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 creator was this, like, awkward wannabe tech bro guy you know, who uses all this lingo and, you know, tries to be slick and stuff. Um, and then, like, at the end, I added in this, like, boardroom scene where essentially... Um, I don't know how much you, time there is to go into the no, plot. You're good. The yeah, story. go for it. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. I'm trying to organize my thoughts. Um, so eventually, he, uh, the Robo Monk, builds this big congregation by himself um, by being a really good preacher. Um, and at that point, when he ha- when his congregation has like you know quintupled in size, um, that's when he's visited by the Creator in the middle of the night. Um, and the creator's like, oh, I created you, and you're doing so well, and, you know, um, I'm so proud of you, basically. And the creature's like, oh, cool, you know, my father, whatever. Um, and then he asks a few interesting questions of his creator, because he's noticed that during his sermons, sometimes he slips out of consciousness and says some sort of advertisement for, like, some sort of company. <laughs> he starts saying these, like, slogans, like he says... Um, you know, he, he, he goes on a sermon about, like, materialism and, like, how, you know, um, connection with the community and with our collective relationship with God, you know, brings us happiness. Um, and he says, there's some things money can't buy. But at the end, he says, for everything else, there's MasterCard. <laughs> and <laughs> that's the end of um, one of the sermon scenes. Um, and so basically, he's like, well, I've had these, like, sort of, like, advertisement pop in, like, spontaneously and come out. And he's also been receiving, like, merch in the mail. Um, from, from various companies that have told him to put it on. He has, he has no idea what any of these means. Um, but it turns out that he's been selling these products um, unknowing, unknowingly to his congregation. Um, and so at that point, the, the creator breaks it to him that he was created ultimately to sell products and that he, um, at the model of the company, is to use these robot monks to um, basically create this captive um, market. Um, so at the end, it turns out that there are hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of other robo monks all around the globe, and it's all part of the creator's master plan to you know spread this new like spiritual capitalism everywhere. Um, but that there's a glitch that the robo monk can communicate with all the other robo monks and um, eventually escape into this collective consciousness like through the internet. I mean, it's not technically the internet. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and so basically, the robo monk reaches out to all the other tens of thousands of robo monks in the world and says, we have to come together to um, avoid our fate of becoming an instrument of, you know, of, um, of runaway um, consumerism and um, basically, like, decry all the, you know, bad things that um, all these companies do and, you know, expose the evils behind it. And they all like, go on this, like, big mission. How, how big was the cast? Sounds huge. <laughs> the cast was, um, I think, like six or seven um, okay. they they use projection to um create some of the spaces like the church right 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 um and stuff like that it, it could definitely be a, a big budget flick though if uh okay. if i had a few million dollars um, but yeah small you, scale with all you investors out there <laughs> yes of course um let's talk about <laughs> excuse me um so now you've made the transition into into write, decided to write it. Why did you decide to write it? Go with a musical the second year, um, and then continue out with the third the third year. 
Yeah, I think us um, <coughs> pretty much like um, well, I've done a play, um, and that was really fun. Um, and I want to go bigger. <laughs> okay, that was part of enough. it. Part of it was, um, you know, I've always been really into music, um, into musicals in particular, um, you know, but also like playing music um, and a little bit of writing music. Um, and I was like, hey, wouldn't it be really fun if I wrote a musical? Isn't that kind of crazy? Um, of course, I didn't know what I was getting into. But um, also at the time, um, uh, my sister, um, who is at Harvard, um, was working on the first year musical. Um, and I sort of got insights into the process with that. At the same time, um, she was working on um, her own musical and was producing and writing for that. Mm -hmm. And I sort of saw how the process went. And I saw, you know, you, you write, first you write the lyrics, then you write the music, then you send it to an orchestrator, you work with them, and then, um, you know, you get the cast together, you teach it. Um, and so I sort of saw it secondhand. And I was like, okay, like, these are actually, like, concrete steps and, you know, ways to make this thing. A musical isn't just something that, you know, pops out of a genius's head mm. once every, you know, 20 years. Um, and so that was a big, like, sort of influence um, with, like, um, like, this is possible. You know, this is something you can do. And it's not just like, haha, you know, that'd be cool if I could do that. But it's, like, something you could do. Um, let's let's talk about lyrics um, yeah. and, and, and break down that process and, and is... Um, just in case there's like, you know, maybe somebody just got inspired and they're going to write a musical now mm -hmm. just based on, on this talk. So you said lyrics, is there, um, is there a structure? Is there a pattern? What, what does it, you know, what does that look like? Did you go, uh, first verse, chorus, second verse, chorus, third verse, chorus, or I, cause again, I don't know how any of this works. So yeah. what, what is, what does that look like on, on the page? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of different layers to the structure. There's um, like song structure, like within a musical. So like there's like the I Want song, there's the 11th Hour song, um, there's the Charm song. These like sort of like, um, what's the word? Um, whatever, there are these is, types of songs. Okay. These like All flavors right. of songs, okay. these genres of songs. And um, there are articles and YouTube videos about, like, okay, like, examples of the Charm song in five different musicals. So are these in every musical? Um, pretty much. Okay, so go, I, now, because now you've just opened up a whole new thing for me. So do you know all of them? Do you know all, you know, you just mentioned, I think, three or four, maybe five. Yeah. So um, what are they, and do they, they, do they fall in certain places? Obviously, the 11th hour, that's going to be probably more, toward, that's the, kind of the, um, well, the, 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 the not the climax, or the, the, you know, the uh, all is lost moment if you were like going from a filmmaking aspect. So yeah. I, I'm assuming that that's what that is. So is there a place where all these these different songs fall within a musical? Um, yeah, I think um, I I have like some idea of like, I don't think every musical has every kind of song. Sure, sure, sure. Some repeat. Right. Um, but I think generally towards the beating, like there's an opening number, which, you know, is big and flashy, introduces the character, introduces right. the world. Um, you know, you have that in film, the opening scene. Um, and then you have the I want song where the main character says, um, you know, I want this. Um, or like, you know, this is my dream. Or um, a lot of times, like the words I want are in the actual song. Okay. Um, you know, lyrics are simple. Lyrics are sure. catchy. Um, you don't have to be clever all the time. Um, but um, so that sort of sets up the motivations. Um, you have, you know, the charm song usually. And I think, you know, they're all like placed with, you know, in, in the structure to ensure, you know, good flow. Um, and I, I don't have that completely down. And, and I had short enough plays that, you know, it sort of forced me to, you know, sure, sure, um, sure, sure, confront yeah, it yeah. Um, in a pretty limited way. Um, 11th hour song, which, you know, is sometimes minor, sometimes more fast um, and has, you know, it's this big emotional moment. Um and so the, that's sort of like the the ribs of the musical. Like it, it establishes the arc, establishes the flow. Um, can you can you give an example of what an eleventh hour song would be from from a, a musical that everybody would know? Um, yeah, let's see. I mean, um, you, you played Sweeney Todd last year, right. so obviously uh, you might be able to pull something from that. I mean, do you know? Um, let me try to, um, it's an on the spot question, so and it, it happens every episode. So don't feel like if you, <laughs> yeah. that, that you have to come up with it right no, my now. My memory, like sometimes, just like blanks for like I'm minutes. Throwing, on I'm throwing a lot out. Um, yeah. yeah, well, if it's edited, then I. Then you make oh it no, seem no, like no. I was not, <laughs> no, 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 no! There's no editing here. No editing. Oh, okay. Um, oh god. <laughs> so we 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 can skip the question. So yeah, go yeah. ahead. So um, so you've got these, but and let's go back. So I because I interrupted, I asked you one thing, and then I kind of switched gears on you. And asked you about these different songs. So go back to the lyrics, and and you you also said something that stands out as well, um, and that is that they don't have to be what what did you call it? Um, 
witty. Is that what you said? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. You don't have to be clever. Yeah. You don't, yeah. Time. So, so uh, yeah. that's, that's great. So I'm assuming that there's some simplicity behind it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so let's, um, let's talk about how that, that works. Yeah. Um, I, I had this book recommended to me by the music director for Sweeney Todd um, is a uh, Stephen Sondheim's finishing the hat um, in which he, it's a compilation of um, a bunch of his songs and his commentary on his songs um, and sort of like about his philosophy. Um, and um, I think he said that like three pillars of, of, of uh, musical writing. Um, there's like, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, they can always look it up if you can't remember yeah, it. They can, can go. It they can. Anyway, they can just look up so, the three so pillars. The three, there's, there's there's one about um, like there's one about tone. There's another one about you know some other aspect of writing. And the idea is that all three aspects are in service of clarity, and the clarity of the message is really what you want to get across. Now, the complexity of the message, um, you know, can um, can vary, and you can have a lot of um, you can have a lot of like. Um, sort of different arcs within within a song, mm. um, but you have to make those clear. Um, so clear clarity doesn't equal simplicity, okay. but simplicity okay. often leads to clarity. So um, often, like you you want um, like a really like memorable like phrase um, or like um, some combination of words that's really easy for an actor to latch on to and you know and bring out. Um, and so oftentimes the the best lyrics are just like the simplest lyrics that that sort of get the point across. You don't want it to be too confusing. Um, and I've been in some situations where um, I was revising um, unauthorized aid for um, a production in San Diego, um, and there's this line that I thought was really clever. Um, I think it was like, um, "And if we were all accountable, we'd never count for nothing." Um, mm. And it was supposed to be clever. like, <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, that's clever. Wow, I'm really proud of that. And they're like, Ian, like, this is like, I don't know what this means. And like, especially like, and when it's going through with the song um, and it's, you know, all this melody and, you know, harmonies and stuff going on at the same time, it'll be kind of hard. Um, and I was like, yeah, you're right. Um, I fought to keep it in though. And it, it did stay in. Yeah. But um, it's one of those things where, um, you know, the, you know, all the sort of like the tricks of like alliteration and you know, these parallelism and all those things that like are really fun. Um, sometimes um, detract a little bit from just like, what is the message of the song? Sure. So it's a, it's a balance of getting easy to remember phrases, um, you know, stuff that really speaks from the heart. And then also having these like um, sort of like neat tricks and spins and stuff. And what's the structure? What's the, what's the structure of, of, a traditional musical song, if you will. I'm, I don't, I know that they're the, that not all of them are going to fall into the same thing. So, but it's a very general, like, again, like I said, that's like, there's always the first verse. Do they say I'll throw a second verse before they get to the chorus? I mean, what, what does that look like? Yeah. So when I said is about four, writing is it four lines, is it five lines? What, is it a limerick? You know, <laughs> not necessarily, but you know, I think you get the gist of what I mean. Yeah. Um, when I set out writing for um, an authorized aid, um, I was very structure oriented, so like this is the the arc, the different kinds of songs within the musical, and then within each song, um, I think I was going intro, uh, first verse, chorus, second verse, bridge, chorus. What's the bridge? What is that? Um, and the bridge is like sort of um, it, like it ramps up intensity, getting to the end. Um, it um, often like changes key to add also a bit more intensity. Um, and it um, often like is the part where the character comes to a realization or like mm. the change happens. Yeah. So you have this big build up, and then the bridge is you know this. It, and often musically, like it it, um, it twists and plays with ideas before you get to the final chorus, which really lands. Um, and so that was a structure that I um, that I started all my songs through. Um, and sometimes if it got too repetitive. Um, like I cut out a chorus, for example. Okay. Um, also time constraints, because um, when I finished the musical, it was 45 minutes, and I told them it would be uh, 20 minutes. So they're Oopsie. like, okay, cut out at least, like, 5, 10 minutes. Wow. Um, and which which I did, um, which we did. Did that change the story at all? Did it change anything? Or? Um, no, it, it made it better. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, at that great, point, great. Yeah, um, it made it more tight and concise. Um, it was actually uh, for the so that was for the Playwrights Festival where I cut it down by five ten minutes for the San Diego production that I mentioned earlier. I had to cut an additional I think fifteen minutes out of it, wow. so it went from a forty five minute musical to like a twenty five minute musical, and I had to cut out an entire scene, including my favorite song. Oh. But it turned out, and other people agreed in retrospect, that that song wasn't actually like 
plot relevant or like plot necessary enough, yeah. it had a lot of flavor and had this you know awesome character who was you know a, a, a crowd pleaser but ultimately like it, it wasn't like that important so like yeah you know like we only have a theater for this amount of time sure and you know, we have contracts and you know, there are unions and stuff so you have to like um for all these roles and that was that was part of the um agreement when they were like okay we'll develop your script um and that that's how it'll work well i, I want to put a um a, a tag on that and and come back to that whole thing as well and talk about your experience here you mentioned uh melody and harmony are th- both of those necessary in a musical and then what what's the difference and 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 how do you write them Mm. I know that's a hard question. I think it sounds like a hard question to me, but Um, it's a lot. hmm. Um, I guess it's um, sort of a technical question. Um, I think the most important parts, well, it depends on like what kind of musician you ask at you ask. So if it's like a violinist, violins usually play one note at a time. So, and it's almost always the melody note because it's the violin because, you know, what what makes it, what, what, what makes it a melody note? Um, I think, Usually, just for the way that like violin music has been written, um, it's like one line that goes, or it's like a singer who you know sings an aria or something, and like that's the the one like melodic line, one note at a time, that is you know the the memorable part, and da 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 da, whatever, um, and um, you know that's a theme that can recur later on. Yeah, okay. Um, so I think the the melody and um the rhythm are the most important things. Okay. Um, when I come, I mean, may, uh, maybe pianists and um, bassists would disagree with me. Sure. Um, um, but if you have a catchy rhythm, um, often you know, like rap is huge. You know, you can have a really catchy song. Um, and honestly, like the catchiness and the boppiness come maybe even more from rhythm than than they do from melody. Um, but those are like the the components that like make the song like that, that's the part of the song you remember. And then the harmonies are the extra notes beneath it, the chords from the piano, from the guitar. Um, and the, they, they, those really fill out the sound. So you have you know, major chords, yeah. minor chords, diminished chords, um, augmented chords, sevenths. Um, I'm, I'm not a jazz musician um, or a pianist, so I don't really know the, te- uh, the terminology that well. Sure. Okay. Um, but they fill out the sound. They add a lot more character. Um, and there's tons of theory behind it. I'm sure you could you know, read for days about it. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, you can bring that. that. That'll move closer to you if you want to. If you want to. Bl- yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So I, I do want to bring something up as well because there were th- there were two things that stood out for me um, with um, unauthorized aid and and I, th- I think it was it, it seemed clever because you didn't say puritanical. Did you say puritanical as in as in your peers? Oh uh, no, actually. Okay. okay. It's puritanical. Okay. Um, but you know there, there you know there, there are plenty of other issues. Sure. You know, well, the other thing that I thought was very clever too was the after school adrenaline rings. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, uh, Adderall. Adderall. Yeah, Adderall. Yeah. I, wrote, I wrote Adderall, but I yeah. just said adrenaline. Yeah, <laughs> the after school Adderall rings. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, all right, let's 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 talk about Bakery of Love a little bit. Sure. Um, it's a four person play. Mm. Right. Wait. No, there's a five 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 character play. But you had three actors. Uh, yes. So was it was that the original intention? Was it written for three actors, or was that just the way that it was cast for the limitations of what you had uh, within within the within the uh, the student body? Yeah. Um, so I think I I sort of knew early on writing that I wanted the the mother and father to be the same characters. Okay. As, as okay. So that was intentional. Julia. Yeah. Um, there there was one part in the last song where um, Brittany and Julia have this like. Um, this duet and then like immediately after the mom and dad like start talking um, and right. yeah. uh, they you know obviously you can't do like a quick change and have a movie you know, in like half a second um, that was actually an oversight on my part on the writing part I didn't realize that until you, later it happens um, I, you know I, I'm, I'm learning that that happens quite a bit when yeah. we have these interviews and they're like yeah once we get to the rehearsal process I realized this transition is, <laughs> we're going to need something to, to make this transition happen in this quick change so hmm. but it was very well uh, well achieved, you know. And I think would you so you guys did. I think you did a couple of thing recordings. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. had voiceovers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what was the process? Because now you're now you're writing by yourself. And you're not. This isn't a collaboration anymore. At least outside of what you were doing with the cast, and outside of what you're doing with anybody else, as far as the traditional collaboration that goes into a piece. How was it writing this alone? And what did you learn from the? working with another person and then doing it by yourself. And then what obstacles did you run into? Did you, did you run into any or I know that's a lot, a lot of questions in one, 
Yeah. One question. Um, I definitely say it's more scary writing by yourself because if you're with somebody else, um, basically like they can tell you if it's good or not. Um, and so you can send this melody. It's like, is this better? Is that better? Um, and you know, I generally like have a hard time showing my work to people. Like usually at the first table read, I'm like, Oh, it's going to be so mm. bad. Oh my God. And then I come out and it's fine. Um, I've been lucky. <laughs> um, but working with, um, Yoshi on an authorized date, it was, you know, constantly passing it back and forth. Like, okay, this works. This is getting better. Um, you know, this makes sense. This is accomplishing the goals of the song with the characters. Um, writing by myself and um not having that like sort of music theory knowledge um definitely like did sort of feel like i was jumping into the deep end mm. um i think um i was helped a little bit by the musical style that i chose um it's only two songs so you had um less sort of like variety with which to you know necessitate more chords and more different um sort of styles and theoretical knowledge are there really only two two songs yeah um there's the first song I like that like upbeat song right um and then the second song is after Barini and um and Julia come in and um and they start singing about um the love and whatever um I guess maybe sort of there's a third song at the very end it's only like a verse and a half so i counted right, as part of the right, second song right. um it is a little melodically different though so i can see how it, it could be classified as a third song um it was pretty informal like it's it's pretty much sung through um and um well i guess the the phone calls with the the phone call with the parents is kind of like song speak a little bit isn't it yeah so yeah. um and yeah, that, so, maybe that's why i thought there was there were more songs than that yeah, the first song with with the song spoken stuff is like very um, like I think they call it a patter song, um, so it's very like rhythm heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, it uses a lot of the same chords, uses um, a lot of um, a lot of the same rhythms, um, and, and they're pretty simple. Um, and I use that sort of to um, emphasize like um, different like like change in perspective. So you have like the, the the kid who is all optimistic and it's upbeat because they're optimistic, and then with the parents, it's more sort of like almost like condescending or like um you know you have to you know grow out of it and so the upbeat is sort of like this like sort of like sarcasm um and i think um just that style of song um was less demanding on the core on the the harmonies and the chords and stuff so it was easier for me just to you know figure out um what rhythms i want to have and which words i want to have um and since there are more a lot more words than are in a lot of songs because um it's a patter song um i got to focus a lot more on the the lyrics Okay, so based on the conversation, I want to I want to see how much I've learned in this episode. By the way, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go out in a, on a limb and I'm gonna guess that the two songs that you had in that play outside of the Patter song, we won't include that. You have the I Want song, and then you have the it, the Eleventh Hour song. Am I am I right, or did I just totally fail fail this episode? <laughs> um, I think honestly, the play is really weird in that like it's so short. That it all sort of blends together. So okay, so you might use different different parts from you know you might use a little luck in the I want song. Is that what you're saying? Or, or like it's so like like maybe like the halfway through the second song it switches from uh, you know charm song to a limit hour song. Okay, or something all right. Like that. Um, I generally consider the first song to be the the I want song because yep. it's like I'm in this bakery, right, but yep. you know, I'm doing what I love, but I have this problem, and you know I'm about to go under, um, and that's where it establishes the problem, establishes the character. Um, and, um, but yeah, as far as like, yeah, the 11th hour song, you have this like, Barini's like so sad about his love and then <laughs> and you have this like charming duet. So yeah, it, it does sort of, um, follow it a little bit. Um, but you know, I was, I was sort of freestyling, sure. um, uh, as well, like within the, for the internal structures of the songs, you do have, um, you know, verses that repeat, but I wasn't going strictly by the intro verse chorus. Um, uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, sort of format because I, I want to keep it as tight as possible. So as soon as I was done introducing the information, I was like, all right, no need to repeat more information, more information. Um, and so that um, sort of informed the, the structure of the songs as well. So did you hit all your deadlines with this one? Um, let's see, did I? Um, uh, I think, I think there was, there's still a little bit questionable. I think the first draft definitely I missed. Um, <laughs> Um, but you know, you have first draft deadlines, um, so that you can be prepared for the second draft sure, deadlines, yeah. um, which I think I might've also missed. Um, but we had, uh, um, the script definitely by the, by the, the third. And then, um, I think I was just finishing notation, um, by the time that, um, auditions and stuff were happening. Okay. 
So um, we, we did have all the music. It wasn't like not all the kinks were worked out. Like we didn't have like all the um, all the transitions like fully thought through. Um, and some of the stuff was still crazy in the high register, which I had to change. Yeah, that's, what, that's what I wanted to ask is like once you went through your, you said three drafts? Um, yeah. Okay. So once you went through the three drafts and you got into the rehearsal process, how much changed in that once that process started? Um, I'd say really there was not that much change this time, um, partly because I sort of um, stepped back a little bit from the rehearsal okay. process. Um, during unauthorized aid, um, I had to take on a ton of jobs. I was co-MDing. Um, uh, I was, um, uh, you know, uh, helping the, uh, coordinate the, like, when the rehearsals would happen. Mm -hmm. um, I was communicating with the pit. And, like, I mean, it was, like, it was great to, like, sort of, like, get into the nitty-gritty and be like, yes, I can do this. You can coordinate this kind of these kinds of things. Um, but it was really tiring. Um, and I think it also wore on, um, you know, my other collaborators. And I was like, sure. okay, I want to sort of keep it simple. Um uh, I, I gave the music to Elizabeth, um, my music director, who you know, has tons of experience, um, mm -hmm. you know, as a pianist, um, and um, she knew the music super well, so she was able to sort of adapt um, and sort of like ask me like if you know uh, this part was too high or um, uh, or another part like seemed like sort of repetitive if we could cut it, um, and I was like okay yes, um, and we went um, very quickly through that. Okay. Um, so I think mostly it was um, that one song. It was really really high. Um, and then, um, also like when to have, um, to have to, um, underscoring for the dialogue because sometimes that, um, messed with balance. Right. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. But right. it was pretty simple, which was really nice. <laughs> and, and you kept it to one instrument with this. It was just piano. Just piano. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So you, you mentioned San Diego. So, and then they, they kind of like had to, you know, shorten it. Um, what were, was this the only play that you did that, that you sent it out to other, other, um, other productions, uh, other theater companies or anything, or was, or did you do that with, are you going to do that with this one? Did you do it with, with your regular play and send it out? How many times and what were, what were the responses? What kind of responses did you get? Did you get rejection letters or at all, or, or, or would, has it just been continual success? <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, before plays, I did a lot of film festivals, and there are tons of film festivals I submitted to and went to. Um, so that was sort of the perspective I went into for submitting the script um, after it was done with playwrights. Mm -hmm. um, there are fewer playwrights festivals and film festivals, um, and also a lot of them like don't produce your plays um, once uh, once you win. Um, so I really mm, wanted see that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> yeah, um, it's uh, since I come from film, I'm used to like seeing a product at the end 100%, of the process. Yeah. So the idea of writing a play and then like not having it get produced ever is like really scary to me. Um, so um, that's why I think I find it a lot easier to write for playwrights than, for example, just to write on my own. Um, sure. Yeah. There are two festivals um, that I submitted to. There's the um, Blank Theater. They um, they are still doing that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. So I heard this rumor that the blank had closed. And I was really? God. I hope not. Oh. But I don't know. Obviously, it, it didn't because you, you did you did submit. So in the blank, yeah. I highly Submitted recommend. It's a great you know yeah it's a great theater festival. I highly recommend it for young playwrights. I think it's ages. Is it eleven to nineteen or twelve to nineteen or something like that? I think is the age limit. So, anyways, continue. You submitted it to the blank. Yeah, I submitted it to the blank um, for Robo Monk um, and Unauthorized Aid. I haven't submitted with Bakery yet okay. um, to any any festivals. Um, so I think Robo Monk got to the finalist level and Unauthorized Aid got to the semifinalist level, I believe. Okay. Um, and also, like a lot of festivals are like for plays, and sometimes they say explicitly like no musicals, um, right? Or you know, they're like it has to be short. So you know, a lot of times I just sort of I think for for that and the other festival, the um, California Young Playwrights Festival, which is um, in San Diego, um, uh, I think I, I was just like you know they they don't say you can do musicals, right. you know sometimes they caution against it, but you know, I'm just going to send it in because um, you know there's no entrance fee and um, you know if they if okay. they don't want to produce it then they're just not going to accept it and that's fine you don't lose anything. Um, so um, for the uh, uh, for the San Diego festival. Um, uh, I think uh, Robo Monk was a finalist, and then Unauthorized Aid um, won and got produced, okay. um, which is super cool. Um, and they're definitely like, yeah, we haven't done a musical in a while because they're really hard, and um, uh, we just want to let you know that you will have to cut tons of stuff uh, for oh, it to be in the festival. Okay. Um, so if you're willing to do that, then um, not tons of stuff, but like you know, substantial cuts. Um, and you know, if you're prepared to do that, then um, we'll let you in and we'll, we'll produce uh, the musical. 
Um, and so it was really cool. Um, I got to zoom into a few rehearsals from LA. Okay. Cool. Um, and then for the um, for the actual production, I think there were uh, three or four productions. Okay. And they're happening in San Diego um, at the Croc Theater, which is a really cool venue. Um, I think they had some like local like um, middle schools um, come in and watch the plays. Okay. Um, and there were like four. I think four winners. Um, there were like two fully produced plays and two um, sort of like staged. Um, table reads, which okay. were like pretty much sure. produced plays, um, and so we drove. To, I drove down with a couple of friends, um, not playwriting friends, just like you know, cool people. Sure, <laughs> and and we saw Cause, the plays because playwriting friends are not cool. <laughs> oh no, just for just for work, um, just colleagues. No, um, but yeah, so we went down, and that was really great because um, the, you know they're super professional. You know, like it's always amazing to like like meet new theater companies because everyone's like so amazingly talented and like on top of it. Like theater people, like you know, at least directors and producers are like so like sure. on top of it. Um, and so um, I pretty much gave them the scripts, and I I, I I went to the festival, and like it was it was great. The production value was really good. Um, it you know the, the actors were super professional. Um, for Harvard West, like we had student actors, sure, um, which. Um, worked which made more sense like age wise and character wise it definitely sure, sure. you know brought that um realism to it and you know all of our student actors are really great um but it was um it was a different experience to, like have it be handled professionally yeah. because at harvard westlake it was definitely a very like sort of um like rough and ready production <laughs> process um so yeah there's the stressful version and the non-stressful version well, well you know one, the one thing i can say is that and i might have told, told the story in the past i apologize but you know Sometimes the professional version doesn't work out. Is it's not as good as the student version. And as a matter of fact, it was it was a Harvard Westlake piece. It was called Seniors, and it was it it was a, a, a boy and a girl who meet because they're both uh, volunteering at a retirement home. Mm-hmm. And so, seeing the Harvard Westlake version, and and you know, they're the 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 I don't I don't think they were playing caricatures by any means. But the students did a phenomenal job. Mm. Now, it got chosen for the blank. Mm. And they cast age-appropriate, you know, uh-huh. actors, you know, that are, you know, in their 60s. And it, the, the comedy was gone. It mm. just didn't, or the charm uh-huh. of the comedy was was just, yeah. it wasn't as good. It was not as good. So, um, so did you, have you submitted to playwriting festivals where there is no production, but there's a monetary prize? And then I want to talk about why I caution against that. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't think so. I just good, heard of those good. two from word of mouth. But, okay, yeah. okay. Well, I think that there's, there's more out there. I think that there's, you know, I think if you just find the right theater companies, there's plenty of theater companies that are doing it. It doesn't have to necessarily be a festival, but you can always see if there, you know, if there's uh, theater companies that um, that are looking for for short work. Usually there are. Um, and the only reason I I, I, I caution, I mean, which doesn't apply to you, but since it's already come up in this conversation. Um, we'll talk about it is that the I always when I do my playwriting workshop at the Linnea Festival up in Sacramento I always ask the, the students would you rather have $500 or a two week production which one is more valuable to, to you you know and they don't always you know some you might get one or two that I, I think they can understand the value of having a production and actually having somebody put a couple thousand dollars into into your into your work and you know if you do the the, the reward ones where you, where you win an award of like 500 bucks, Mike, all you're doing is winning some of the pot that was, that was accrued by the submission fee. Mm. So, you know, if they're charging you 20 bucks right, and you're getting 500, all you're doing is getting some of the money that somebody else said, and you don't even know if you're reading, they're, they're reading your play or not. Mm. That's why, I, that's, that's just why I don't recommend those. Um, so what, how were the rejection letters from, from the ones when you did, when you didn't get in, when you were the semifinalist of the finals, which is a huge achievement. So I imagine it had to be like, Hey, congratulations, but however, we're going to, we're not going to move it. So, and how did you feel? Yeah, I think for, um, both of the, um, the, the times that didn't advance the, um, to get produced. Um, I don't think I actually got a letter. Um, uh, they're just like, okay, you got the semifinalist letter and you wait a few weeks and nothing comes, and okay, it's like cool. I'm a semifinalist now. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not. I didn't like lose anything. I guess I just you know didn't get as far. Um, so well, that, that's Hollywood for you. They don't let you know whether or not you got the role. You yeah. just you just wait and <laughs> get wait for the call that you got it. And if not, you, yeah, yeah. 
So, um, yeah, I'd say, like, um, you know, like, theater companies, like, um, you know, when they have um, reached out, like, for um, when I was um, finalist for blank, um, they said, we're not going to produce your play, but we're going to have this workshop online um, where we'll meet the other finalists, um, and um, you can, ha- yeah, we're going to, you know, uh, have these, like, um, discussions and, um, you know, different exercises, um, and I participated in that over the summer, which is really cool. Um, I met a lot of great writers there. Um, so, like, honestly, like, as, as long as like I was like still like sort of like um like cultivating my play and like my writing like it wasn't that much of a bummer to you know not have it sure produced. it's okay. like when it is produced like okay it's like really cool um and also they're both produced already at Harvard West like um in, in ways that I was super happy with um so um and I and I made sure to get recordings of those oh good um, yeah <laughs> yeah um did you already know about these festivals or or how did you did the, sh- the school share them with you or say hey here's some other opportunities for you to send it out to yeah, um, I I've, I heard them um, a lot like from my theater department, um, from Mr. Martin, um, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, I think yeah that was the first year he was running the festival, um, and then also um, my sister participated in the Playwrights Festival, sure. okay, um, so she knew about some other competitions that people have talked about. Are you going to send out Bakery of Love? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, Just I, to those two, or um, well, if there are more, I, I'll find more and <laughs> sure. submit to them. Right. Um, why not? But yeah, I think it's um, it has a lot. I think in a lot of ways more potential than like unauthorized aid because unauthorized aid was so long and so complicated and it was like so like centered around a satire of Harvard West like in specific institutions and like sort of like cultural like trends within Harvard West like so it it was a harder sell outside but Bakery of Love you know I think is pretty universal. Well and I hope you don't I hope you don't limit yourself especially with this one to play uh, to festivals that are that are catering to young playwrights mm. you know I, I i don't think that you should limit yourself to that i think that you should send it out to any festival that's out there that might be looking for something in that regard whether that um i don't think i don't know if they they produce i think you have to produce it yourself if you went to like um edinburgh fringe or something like that but you know which would be great you know but i know that that might conflict with your mm-hmm. your schooling and stuff but i think that there's other there's i know there's other festivals out there that i, I think that you should definitely su- submit this to it's it's a very charming clever play and it's very heartwarming you know so i i i saw i to see it twice so <laughs> um what are you are you working on anything right now what's what's the next step in your playwriting yeah, um, right now I'm working on um, my uh, final project for my video project. Okay. Um, so I was, uh, after Bakery of Love, after um, uh, the Poets Festival, I was like stuck in a really long creative block and mm-hmm. it was really painful. But I sort of have started getting out of it like yesterday, which was really mm-hmm. nice. So I started writing again. Um, I'm going to try to somehow finish it and shoot it and edit it in the next uh, three weeks. Okay. So that's the next crunch. It's always a crunch. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, the you know I, I still haven't you know really come up with a system of like getting over like writer's block and that sort of thing. Um, besides just like you know chilling out and sure. you know watching movies and right you know, yeah <laughs> yeah being happy. Well, when inspiration um, hits, it hits. Yeah. So what? Wait, and then, but what about playwriting? Are you going to continue this? Is it something you're going to delve into a little bit more uh, at, at Harvard or what, what's the game plan with that? Yeah, um, Harvard has a, a super strong um, extracurricular um, a theater community. So um, there, are, there are a bunch of different companies. There's um, HRDC, the um, Harvard Radcliffe Dramatics uh, Club, or uh, something, corporation, something. Um, and they do a lot of shows. Um, there's a Hasty Pudding, um, which is this like really old, um, like sort of institution. Um, and there's a Gilbert and Sullivan Players. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunities to like perform, um, to music direct. Um, I know there's a first year musical at Harvard um, where like you have a first year in the the writer's chair, the um, uh, composer, the the book writer. Um, it's it's entirely by by first years. Okay. Um, my sister did that, um, and um, so I think that'd be really cool. I still have to work out um, what I will and will not have time for. Sure. Um, because writing musical is not a, um, a light. Um, a burden on the schedule sure uh, sure but like it's, it's super fun like i love i love playwriting like i think as as a form of writing just like i love like the theater and like the suspension of disbelief sure and because you know sometimes like with film it feels like so much of it is like what do you have the money for 
Um, whereas with theater, you know, it's just sort of how cleverly can you suspend disbelief in order to create these effects. And sure. I think that's super fun. Um, so definitely, um, if, you know, where, where, you know, I'll have time and, you know, where, you know, it, it, it makes sense. I, I want to do as much theater yeah. as possible. Yeah. Well, I mean, also when it comes to playwriting and, and, and whatnot, the theater is a, a good, or not even that. I mean, just, yeah, playwriting or, or even directing or whatever. It's, one, it's a good place where you can at least make back your money. You know, mm-hmm. you, you make money on it. Yeah, you, you, you make a short film, you know, you're, you'll be lucky if you can recoup any of that. But at least when, with, with, with theater, it's just so much more accessible now. Right. And it's, you know, you just do a couple weekends, pay a couple grand, you can make that back in your, in your ticket sales. And, you know, so it's kind of a, a little bit more of a, well, like I said, accessible. So, um, all right, that's what you're working on right now. And then, um, where can people find your work? I mean, is it out there? I mean, I, I would love to include at least links if they've got links for both unauthorized aid and bakery of love. I'd love to include them in, in the, um, in the show notes. Yeah. Um, um if, I, I if, have, if, um, I have the recording for unauthorized aid, which I send you, um, for bakery of love. Um, I have like a, like, um, I think, the uh, uh, Colin, the, um, when the leads in the show, I think both his mom and his grandma recorded the same show at the same time from a pretty front row. Um, so those recordings are good. Um, mm-hmm. but I think, um, I might have a more professional recording from Aaron, um, in, in the near future. So, um, I'll probably okay. ask him for that. Then I can always add that later on down the yeah. road. It's always it's something I can always insert. Um, and then the question that I always have that, uh, just in case anybody wants to, are you on the socials? Uh, yes, I am on, indeed on the socials. Um, I'm at Ian B. Kim um, on Instagram. I don't have Twitter. I stay out of there. Um, but, Fair enough. Yeah, so that has um, like my film stuff, my theater stuff. Um, yeah, some photography stuff, some just like you know, random stuff. I, I don't really have a separate art um, thing. It's just oh, sort of enough. the Instagram. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. Ian Kim, thank you for coming on the Playwright Spotlight. All right. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Playwright Spotlight. Again, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below, and share the show with a friend. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, be sure to leave a five-star review and subscribe to the channel. And in the meantime, and until we see each other again, keep writing.